welcome to the Murfreesboro City Board of Education meeting. We will now stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Good evening, Dr. Gilbert. Good evening. I am thrilled tonight to introduce you to a group of young people that I think really are amazing. I heard them last week and I told Miss Trail, I said, Miss Trail, if there's any way that we can get them to come to the school board meeting, I'd like for our school board members and for the public to hear them. And so this is the Bradley Choir. As you know, Dr. Kim Fowler is the principal at Bradley and she's with us tonight. And this is Miss Karen Blooding, who is a music teacher there. And so we welcome the Bradley Choir.
for me not to say something. I know you really want to hear them sing a couple more, so I'll just say a couple things. They've been the most amazing group to work with. My first year with this group at Bradley, and they have just taught me maybe more than I have taught them. Wonderful, energetic, talented, talented kids. We just had a blast. And I really appreciate the wonderful opportunity I've had to work with them and with this wonderful school district. Uh, we have two more pieces we'd like to sing. They're not in English. Uh, we're doing multicultural songs, as you can probably tell. And the last two, first one's in Arabic, and it is a blessing, a blessing for all good things and peace. And then the, the final one is a mixture of languages from all over the world uh, called Sahaita, and Sahaita means unity, and you'll see them clapping and pointing up and doing lots of great rhythmic stuff with that. So thank you for the opportunity to sing for you all tonight and for the special work that you do for our kids and for the staff here in Murfreesboro. All right.
thank you all. You all were awesome. Listening to you, it's just hard to believe you're an elementary school choir because you are so impressive. I want to clap and point up and go Etta to, to you all. Terrific job. Thank you. 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 His hands are going to be tough. <laughs> Almost keep high five. You know, this is why we have to keep arts in the school. How many males have more fun than kids? <laughs> Just think how the music program has changed. to give it. This is certainly a wonderful way to get our meeting started. Thank That's you so right. much. Thank you. At this time, we'll ask for Mayor Tommy Bragg to come forth to administer the oath of office to our re-elected members and our newly elected members. And we'll also ask the family members of the newly elected and the re-elected to come forward, come up in this area. You can use that ramp. Come up and be a part of the swearing-in. You can come at this time. I do solemnly affirm. I, I do, do solemnly affirm, affirm that I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution of the State of Tennessee, of the State of Tennessee, and of the United States, and of the United States, and the Acts constituting the Charter, and the Acts constituting the Charter of the City of Murfreesboro, of the City of Murfreesboro. And that I will faithfully, and that I will faithfully, zealously and impartially, zealously and impartially, discharge the duties, discharge the duties of a member of the Board of Education, of a member of the Board of Education of the City of Murfreesboro, of the City of Murfreesboro, without fear or favor, without fear or favor, and for the public welfare, and for the public welfare. Congratulations, you are duly sworn. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, family members. Thank you very much. Yes. Be sure and support them. They're going to need a lot. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. We'd now like to have a motion for the approval of tonight's agenda. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. Thank you. Dr. Gilbert, communications? We do have several communications tonight. I'd like to congratulate, first of all, and wish best wishes to the retiring employees who were honored by the board at the Doubletree on May the 17th. It certainly was a special evening, and thank you all for being there. We also need to make an announcement that future school board meetings will be held on the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month, and they will start at 6 o'clock beginning in June instead of 6.30, so uh, the public can make note of that also. And we did have a couple of BEP mini-grant recipients. They are Julie Castor at Bellwood, and the title of her mini-grant was Little Leaf Sprout Cooperative, and Debbie Hickerson of Case and Lane, who had two. The first was Who Doesn't Like Algebra and Who Needs Dirt, and I don't want to answer either one of those questions. Um, <laughs> Mitchell Nelson would like to thank the following for their donations for their trip to Land Between the Lakes. They, together these folks raised over $900 for the students who might not otherwise have been able to attend. And those contributors are Advantage Mini Storage, Gas World, 
Air Renovation, Haynes Brother Lumber, Avery Smith, Carl and Suzanne Eubanks, Scott and Gail Porterfield, Sleep Centers of Middle Tennessee, and James and Barbara Jean. And we'd also like to congratulate some students from uh, Scales. They were published authors recently in the Young Writers of America 2012, and of thousands of entries that were reviewed, less than 20% were selected, and these were selected uh, from Ms. Ortiz's fourth grade class, Faith Godwin, from Ms. Fulmer's fifth grade class, Trey Berry, Allison Dial, Taylor Duncan, Tamara Johnson, Hope Sledge, Andrew Thomas. From Ms. Womack's fifth grade class, ba Bailey Eshelman, Nick Gardner, Madison Hodges, Claire Mincy, Meredith Neal, and Noah Thomas. And then recently we had the Science Olympiad. This is the Elementary Science Olympiad. Uh, Dr. Pat Patterson and Amy Phelps have certainly been instrumental in that. They are from MTSU, from the Chemistry Department. And we had students uh, from Mitchell, from various um, Murfreesboro City Schools participating. And we have had that since the beginning of this, which I think this is his fifth year. But this year I think it was significant because they gave placements for the top ten places. And of our schools who were participating, every school that we had in Murfreesboro City placed within the top ten. And those, those schools in order are Discovery was f received first place, Black Fox was second, we had Cason Lane that came in fifth, Northfield sixth, we had ninth place John Pittard and Bradley. So we really appreciate the work of our teachers. Most of this occurred after school as far as preparation for the Science Olympiad and really it's a, quite an experience and so I, I encourage uh, our parents to attend the awards ceremony that's held each year uh, and we also thank uh, John Pittard for hosting that and John Pittard has hosted that Science Olympiad since its inception. Northville Elementary celebrated its 25th year with a time capsule dig, and that actually happened today, and I think it was probably broadcast over local television stations, and some of you were there, so thank you very much, and my understanding is it was quite a celebratory time that there are actually some teachers who were there when Northfield first became a school, and uh, we have one, actually a school board member, um, who was there in the <laughs> long years ago, <laughs> and so so I uh, really appreciate the, the teachers who did come today and others who came today for the time capsule dig. We'd like to congratulate Rebecca Few. Uh, as you know, we are moving to Common Core Standards in the state of Tennessee along with several other states. And Rebecca is one of our two representatives on the Common Core uh, training. And she actually is going to be in Washington, D.C., May the 23rd through the 25th. She has been invited to go there for the Achieve Networks Educators Evaluating Quality Instructional Products. And that's really a quip. But what they will be doing is they will be looking at current instruction, current materials, and, and evaluating how well it's going to align with Common Core. So it's quite an honor for Rebecca Few to be representing not only Murfreesboro City, but Tennessee there. We will be holding a reading center ribbon cutting at Mitchell Nelson on Thursday the 24th which is this Thursday at 3.30. This uh, reading center is going to play a, a very vital role in what we're doing here in Murfreesboro City and so we thank the Jennings and Rebecca Jones Foundation for their contribution to the center and we will be holding a ribbon cutting on Thursday at 3.30. And then we'd also like this, to thank the City Council. They have been most gracious to us during the budget hearings, didn't ask a lot of questions and that was a good thing for us. Um, but we do want to acknowledge that they have approved us to receive a community development block grant. It's a public service grant. It is in the amount of $12,000 and it will be supporting our Franklin Heights Learning Center. And those are your communications. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. We're now down to con consent items. If there are no questions, we'll ask for a motion for the approval of consent items. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. Okay, on the action items, number A, Ms. Baker. Okay, um, your first action item is election of a new vice chair. According to board policy BO3 and according to the state statute, Tennessee Code Annotated Section 49-2-202C2, and Section 25-6 of the Murfreesboro City Court, Code, board officers are to be elected annually. 
The state statute mandates that the board only elect a board chair. However, the board policy B03 mandates that the board elect a board chair and a vice chair. And due to the fact that Ms. Nancy Duggan, the former board vice chair, is no longer on the school board, we need to hold elections for a new vice chair. Um, the term for this position would be through October 31st, 2012, the end of Ms. Duggan's original um, vice chair term. Nominations for board vice chair will be given um, following, followed by a roll call for votes. A majority of the entire board, not just those board members present, that means four votes, is necessary for one to be voted into office of vice chair and board officers cannot be elected by acclamation. After the nominations have been made and seconded, Ms. Ridley will call your name and should state the name of the nominee you are voting, and you should state the name of the nominee you are voting for. Please remember it takes four votes for a member to be elected. Now we will call for nominations for vice chair. Ms. Rainier. I'd like to nominate Mr. Butch Campbell. Um, I think that this position should be someone who has some tenure on the board, and we know he's been with us here for the last four years. He was just recently reelected. Um, Mr. Campbell has the expertise of having been an administrator, a principal for many years, so he has the background in education, and he he knows Robert's rules of order, so he could handle a meeting, and I think that would be effective. Are there any other nominations? Okay, seeing none, I will close the floor for nominations. And um, Ms. Ridley, if you could take a roll call vote for the vice chair by um, the, going through each member and them naming who they're voting for. Butch Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Butch Campbell. <laughs> Butch Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Okay, seeing that um, Mr. Campbell has received um, all of the votes, Mr. Campbell, congratulations, you are now the vice chair. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, confidence given to me by members of the board and under the leadership of Ms. Wade, we will continue to move forward. Congratulations, Mr. Campbell. Thank you. All righty. Dr. Gibber, back to you for action items. Yes, your action items are the approval of board policies, and I'm going to turn to Ms. Baker for that. Okay, the first um, board policy that you have before you tonight is board policy PER 22, dealing with personnel records, and this policy is before you for first reading. Um, this policy has been revised um, to specify the records that are required upon employment. That is in the first section of the policy. The next section deals with the records that must be maintained in the personnel file. Um, you'll note that um, item four under guidelines for maintaining the personnel file, it includes what records um, must be made available to the public under the Tennessee Open Records Law and what records must be redacted, what information must be redacted under the Tennessee Open Records Law. Um, if you have any questions or comments on this policy, I'll be glad to entertain them. Okay, um, seeing no questions, um, we're ready to see if you're ready for this policy to move forward on first reading. Will I entertain a motion for passing? So moved. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and second. All in favor, board members, aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next board policy that you have before you tonight for first reading is board policy STU 18, child abuse and or neglect. This policy has been greatly revised from the policy that is currently on the books. <clears throat> Um, the reasons for the detail in this policy 
um, stem from the fact that it, do, it is tied directly to state law and requirements that are imposed on each and every employee of the school system, whether it be a teacher, a cafeteria worker, a bus driver. All employees are obligated to follow and abide by this law. And I thought it was beneficial to the employees that they were fully aware of exactly what the state law requires of them. So um, that is why you see the detail that you will see in this policy. Um, I may make um, a couple of revisions to make it read easier. It's bought just by putting in um, breaking up these long paragraphs with some section um, titles at the top of them um, to, to make it flow easier. But that would be the only change I would bring back to you on second reading. Do you have any questions or comments on this policy? Uh, just maybe three things. I, I was reading it and <clears throat> lines 20 through 23 that, that defines abuse, I thought maybe we could move that up to right under line one, just because people reading it will know what constitute abuse. And uh, also, let's see, what was the other one? there was nothing in lines 14 through 18 about uh, contacting director of schools. I didn't know if I just missed that or maybe um, you can answer that. There, typically the, the way that um, this would work is first, first and foremost you have to um, contact the, of course, Department of Children's Services. And then um, the director has delegated this responsibility to the coordinator of social services for the school system. Um, and if you want that, there could be something added that the coordinator shall inform the director. It might be helpful, you know, it's just helpful for people to know that. There will be an administrative director that will follow this that will take care of a lot of the specific procedures. But I think that the primarily, the probably the most important part of this is the understanding that whoever has first-hand knowledge has to make that call to DCS. And I share this with the board at the work session, but I will share it with the public. Um, we have been in contact with the SIPIT team, it's called SIPIT team, which works with the Child Advocacy Center, and we are planning to have pretty extensive training this fall for all of our employees. I think that's really important. Ms. Junior, um, Ms. Baker, I just want to thank you for clarifying this policy. In years past in my former life when I was teaching, we have gone through many revisions of this policy. In some cases, we were to notify Children's Services. In other cases, we were to notify our administrator. Then, again, that would be passed on to the superintendent or director of schools. So I really like that this is clarified that, yes, it is your responsibility, as it is for anyone in the public, if you know of something that's amiss, that a child is being abused or harmed in any way, you're responsible for reporting, and I think this is perfectly spelled out. I think you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vernier. Mr. Campbell. Ms. Vernier, are you saying reporting to Department of Children's Services? Okay. We're ready for a motion. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, sign of aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Thank you. Okay. Now the next policy being brought to the board tonight for first reading is Board Policy STU 43, Use of Personal Communication Devices in Schools. This um, policy is designed to help regulate um, students bringing in um, personal communication devices and electronic devices. Personal communication devices um, is defined in the policy to include cell phones, iPods, iPads, etc. Um, and those would be devices that emit an audible signal, vibrates, displays a message, or otherwise summons or delivers a communication to the possessor of the device. A personal electronic device, it would encompass um, cameras, recorders, or a player, or any such item that electronically trans transmits or receives a signal, image, sound file, or a data file or message. 
Under this policy, the personal communication devices and personal electronic devices may be stored in backpacks, purses, personal carry-alls. However, the use of the device is forbidden during the academic day, on a school-sponsored trip, or during the extended school program unless it has been approved by the principal or the principal's designee, or if it's during the extended school program by the ESP site director or their designee. And um, a student that violates this policy would be subject to having the device taken up from them. The device would be held in a secure location by the principal or the ESP site director and would be returned to the parent of the child. And um, this also includes that cell phones and other personal communication devices are not to be used, accessed, or displayed while on a school bus as well. Um, so this is um, a revision to the policy to clarify the rules on bringing those items to school. It isn't, um, there will be times when the principal or the ESP site director can allow the use of them, such as on reward days or if a child needs to use it to call their parent if they forgot their lunch money or they're sick, but otherwise they should not be used during the school day. Do you have any questions on this policy? Mr. Campbell. Ms. Baker, where does it spell that out when the student can use the device? That would be spelled at when they can use it. It's, it's at the principal's discretion there. If you look in line um, 28 through 30, where it says that um, the use of the devices is forbidden during academic days, school sponsored trips, or during ESP, unless approved by the principal or principal's designee or ESP site director or ESP site director's designee. Thank you. Any more questions for Ms. Baker? Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor of board say aye. 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 Okay, the next policy before the board, and this policy is before the board on final, for final reading, um, due to the fact that it needs to be placed in the student handbook that will be published um, shortly to be handed out as children register for school um, and return to school. This would be the um, student board policy STU 23, the Code of Acceptable Behavior and Discipline. And under state law, we are required to include this policy in the parent student handbook that is given to all students that attend our schools. Um, this has had some minor changes to it from the original policy. You'll see um, the changes will, are outlined in bold. Um, in this policy. Are there any questions for Ms. Baker? Hearing none, Ms. Ridley, since this is our last time to hear this, if you would please call the roll for our new board members. Mr. Barrett? Yes. Dr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Campbell? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Renier? Aye. Ms. Lowe? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Ridley. Okay. And now the next books. The next policy brought before the board tonight for final reading um, is board policy STU 23, discipline procedures. And this policy works hand in hand with the code of acceptable behavior and discipline. This policy sets out the various levels of um, misconduct and what the um, discipline procedures and consequences are for each level of misconduct. Um, again, this policy is being brought to you tonight for final reading due to the fact that it does need to be included in our student parent student handbook and um, it is required to be included in there under state law as well. And the changes that were made to this policy you'll find in bold as well. It's had some minor revisions to it. Mr. Barry. Um, just a quick thing, uh, line 132, 
it's got right twice. I just want to make sure we don't mm -hmm. put right twice. Okay, I'll correct that. <laughs> and also, Ms. Rainier had caught a change that needed to be made in line 134. Um, it will read, the student may appeal a change in school assignment um, to the board. And that, that ability to appeal such a disciplinary reassignment is actually stems from the discipline policy and also there is another state statute that deals with students appealing assignment to the board. And I'll, I'll footnote that policy as well. Thank you, Ms. Payton. Um, on line 32 where it talks about maintain a written record of the offense and the disciplinary action, where will that record be maintained and when will it be expunged from the student's record? Will it follow that student to middle school? I believe the, the disciplinary records are to be maintained in their um, educational records file and they are not removed. It's my understanding they're not supposed to be removed. At any time? Um, I'll defer to Dr. Gilbert. Yeah. I think that, that with the records, I think you would find that um, depending upon the severity of, of the offense, then you're going to have it follow that child. I think if it's a, uh, in or out of school suspension or an expulsion, those are the disciplinary actions that have to be documented and maintained in a student's uh, educational file. If it's something that falls under um, a non-statutory type of discipline, a verbal reprimand, um, a counseling, um, some sort of discipline of that nature, there's not a statutory requirement that it be maintained in their educational file. Does that answer your question? I just want to make sure that um, if it's not consequential in any way, then it not follow that child into middle school. <clears throat> Ms. Rainier, I, I believe in answer to Ms. Phillips, I think that perhaps the misbehavior level one are things that are handled in the classroom more than likely, and the teacher is the one who keeps a record of that, maintains that record, um, unless this is beyond that. I, I think that when we get into another level of discipline or disruption that goes into level two or, or so on and so forth where the principal keeps a record, the office maintains a record, and then goes into the more severe consequences. But I did want to make a comment that I really like the way that, Ms. Baker, you have referenced the board policies for these different types of infractions. Uh, for instance, lines 32 and 33, excuse me, 22 and 23, harassment and violation of blah, 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 and you relate it back to the board policy, the bullying related back to the board policy. And I really like the way that you have included any of these behaviors that are committed on the school bus because they are still our children on that school bus. So I think that's real important. Yeah, Ms. Phillips. I was just going to follow up that um, it, on line 85, it does talk about the, when the principal shall maintain a written record. Right. And I just wanted to, that's why I was trying to clarify the difference between the written record on line 32 and the written record on line 85 and will the line will the written record in line 32 follow the child in an educational record i think that if you look at misbehavior level 1 mm -hmm. there is um, the there is a, a category for in school suspension i think if it did if it did rise to the level of in school suspension that would be something that probably would remain documented I believe in school and out of school. I, I can double check that for you, but I thought that in school and out of school suspension and expulsion had to be documented. Well, tardiness is not, I mean, it's it's not an ideal situation to happen, but I, and I know that occasionally children are put in in school suspension because of excessive tardiness. Is that not true? I'm, I'm not aware of that, I, and, and the reason I say that, and it may be happening, but I know that it's been very difficult for principals to decide if there would be any kind of repercussions for tardiness because they really feel it's the parent's responsibility. And so, and even previously when I was here, we really never reached a conclusion about what is tardy. And so it, it 
pretty much is up to the principal's discretion. I will tell you that I have been in communication with uh, Judge uh, Donna Scott Davenport, and she has been very pleased with us this year as far as what we've done with with the tardies, with the absences, and I think really that has to do with Crystal Ferris being the designated person for handling those because that allows us to, to intervene with children whenever they do move and to be aware of what's happening at home. And, and she works very closely with uh, Tanya Hobbs with the social services, and that seems to have helped a tremendous amount this year as far as unexcused absences and tardiness. So I think as far as tardiness, our, our principals have been very lenient because they do feel it's the responsibility of parents. Right. And so what you will have happening there frequently is instead of there being any kind of repercussions on the child, you'll have the social service department called and they will see if they can help in any way with with uh, taking care of uh, making sure the students are there on time. So the children are not being put in? Um, I'm not aware I of it. I will, I will certainly check on that though. Okay, great. And where it says classroom tardiness, mm -hmm. that may be the child that dawdles in the hall and doesn't get to class in time when they're going in between classes. That may be what um, the type of discipline that they would get this minor level discipline for the child that takes their time and wanders around instead of going straight to class in the time they've got in between classes. And with it, the way that it's worded, classroom tardiness, that may be what the intent was. And I think with, with all of these, you'll see there's quite a span of disciplinary options that are available there. Mm -hmm. And in some of these, you'll find that, that some of the behaviors, may you may find them at level one and level two, depending upon what we're seeing as far as the recurring and the habitual kinds of instances. So I think that with, with a lot of the disciplinary act, options, you're going to see the minimal option taken, especially if it's the first time, second time, and usually that's going to correct it. Now, if it, if it doesn't, then there's leeway here for the principal to take additional action, but I think that the way the policy is written, I think it gives quite a few options to our administration for, for handling discipline, and I appreciate that very much. Mr. Campbell. I'm not real sure. <clears throat> Ms. Phillips, how it's done uh, other places, but I think we have to remember sometimes we may have a student who is enrolled in one city school and then may transfer to another. And certainly if that child has been a discipline problem in school A, those people in school B want to know about it. And therefore, some of those records, some of those events, some of those occurrences may be transferred along with their record. Uh, as, as it would be even going from, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, our schools to any of the county middle schools. If the child is a constant behavior problem and discipline problem, certainly those people at that school that's going to be receiving that child would like to know about it so that at least they can have a heads up and get ready. So sometimes it'll follow. Yeah, that's why we're saying consequential. Anything yeah. that was not consequential, I did not want to follow the child. Are there any more questions for Ms. Baker on this policy? Hearing none, we'll ask for a motion and a second. Take a vote. Moved and approved. Second. There's a motion and second. Board members all in favor, sign of aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. I am bringing before you on action item D. Um, you will remember that tenure is kind of in limbo right now. We are in, in the middle of going through the new process, but we can grant tenure to those teachers who have been in our system before, have, have taken a leave and returned back to us, and that is the case with Jennifer Harris. She's a teacher at Mitchell Nelson. She had been previously with the system. She's a very high-level teacher, and we are asking for your approval for tenure for her. Any questions, board members, for Dr. Gilbert before we ask for a motion to approve this? You said she was with us and yes. then left and came back. Where did she go when she left? Oh, I don't guess that's it really matters. That's really... She, she was at home. She was a mommy at home. Thank you. Okay. I talked with her black fox. She taught at black fox. She was she, good, too. <laughs> 
I'm sure she, she was. I'm not sure we, we were very glad curious. to get her back. <laughs> I'm very glad to get her back. <laughs> so I'm asking for your approval for that. Thank you. And as we approve? Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, Ms. Ridley, if you'll call the roll. Mr. Barrett? Yes. Dr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Miller? Aye. Ms. Veneer? Yes. Ms. White? Yes. Under reports and information, you have a discussion regarding the schedule of special or policy, um, board policy review meetings, Ms. Wade, and I will turn that over to you. At this time, board members, if there's there needs to be some discussion. It was brought up at our last policy session that we would meet every other month for our board policy reviews. And that way it would just give us a chance to review the policies a little bit more. Maybe do a few more of them at one time. Give you a chance to look over them if there's no change. Ms. Baker has asked in the past if you review some of the policies you're welcome to send that list or send that to her if there are no changes. That really helps us get through these policies because some of them we only touch and there's no change. So we're asking for discussion tonight on your feelings on making uh, our study sessions every other month on the second Tuesday. Mr. Campbell? Well, as I said during the work session and as Ms. Baker verified, we've still got several policies to go through. And I really believe that we are still on a little bit of a time frame to get those done. Uh, I'd like to see us continue to meet every month until we get those completed. And whether or not we're, of course, we're going to start meeting at 6 instead of 6.30. Uh, if we want to meet till 8.30, you know, I really think that we need to push forward to get the policies completed and get that procedure done like we need to do. Mrs. Renew? Well, having just, you know, we had Mr. Thompson at our retreat, and he talked about us as a board needing to have a vision. And then I recently attended my TSBA orientation, and also they talked about the board setting, having a vision, setting long-range goals and planning. And I think that it would be effective to have meetings as we've been having in order to do that. But I agree, I counted the number of policies. We still have 73 more policies. And at the TSBA meeting, they said we should be doing these yearly. So I, I know we're behind, and, and I know some of them are way back, and I think I looked at some that were 96 and 97. So we do have a ways to go on the policies. I think maybe TSBA may have misquoted on that yearly. Some of them we will do to the law, have to revisit. And Ms. Baker gets those that we revisit every year because of maybe a law change or a bill or something. But there's a two-year uh, on those policies. You visit them every two years. But you visit them as we need to. I mean, you're not right. strung out there not uh, being able to do it. Uh, are there any more comments about the... Um... I have a comment. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Phillips? Um, I can see going ahead and continuing our schedule until we get through the, the bulk of um, the policies. But I do think that there is a, a sound argument for um, meeting every other month after that. As far as the visioning session, I've agreed. In fact, that's why I brought that up, because I believe we, as a, as a new board, we need um, a new, fresh vision for our system that incorporates and, and shows respect for um, the elements of our vision that, that was before. But um, in, I would love to see us do that in a retreat. And um, in the past, I think they've gotten perhaps someone, a professional, to help us come in and work as a team to um, uh, someone who's very good at, at uh, facilitating visioning sessions to come in and work with us at a team, as a team during a, a retreat. And I think that's very, very effective, and I'd love to be a part of that. Rather than, and then we could do it as a whole piece rather than doing two hours here, two hours there, two hours somewhere else. But I do think it's important. I'd love to see us be able to go down to every other month. Um, and give Miss Baker more time. She's, you know, she's a very busy lady to to work with us and and give us more time to review after we have finished the bulk of the uh, policies that we have to review at this time. 
it's barren, no more comments, then we'll entertain a motion. <laughs> Someone have a motion? I'll make the motion that we continue as we are until we get through uh, the bulk of the policies and then after that we can come back and look at whether we want to meet work session every month or every other month. Second. There's a motion and a second. Questions? Mrs. Ridley, if you'll call the roll. Sir? Yes. Brown? Yes. Campbell? Yes, ma'am. Aye. Yes. Yes. Aye. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Okay. Mr. Anderson, I'm going to turn the rest over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gilbert. The uh, next item is is the report on the finances. Uh, we have at this point a little over four million dollars as net income, which uh, basically is our cash flow up to this part of the year. We're at 83.3 percent of our fiscal year. Last year at this time, we were at three million seven hundred and sixty-seven million. So we are uh, ahead of last year at this time in that area. On revenues, we have really good news on sales tax collections. We're up. $410,000 over last year at this point, which is absolutely wonderful. And property tax, we're up uh, roughly $212,000. We're also up on the uh, basic education program, which is BEP, because of our growth that we have uh, received year to date. And I'll, I'll explain the growth when I get to the next report. On our expenditure side, oh, I'm sorry, and on, on the bottom of that, we're at 89.3% of our revenue and again, our year is at 83.3, so we're ahead of, ahead of target there. And we're about a half percent better overall than we were last year at this point based on budgetary numbers. In our revenue, I mean, on our expenditure side, we're at 80.9 percent of our expenditure, again, at 83.3, so that is also a, a good point to be. Last year at this time, we were at 81.4, so we are about five, a half percent ahead there. We were half a percent ahead on the revenue, so one whole percent on a 50 plus million dollar budget is a lot of money. So uh, we feel pretty good about our, our revenues coming in now and about our expenditures uh, remaining under control. So does anyone have any questions on our um, financial package so far? Okay, the uh, next piece is the enrollment. Piece. We are 213 students over last year at this time, and that is the growth part that I was talking to you about. Now, growth money from the state does lag behind. Uh, we get two installments, one in January and one in May. Um, so we are expecting another payment here very soon. Um, but that's, that's an excellent number to be over. And we're 165 over what we had budgeted originally. So again, that is another excellent number. Our growth has been very good. And, uh, thanks to the economy of, of the city, it, it's done very well that people are, are coming, moving back into the city, in which we're real, real glad that they are. Our PTR ratio for K through 3 is at 18.92. We have been able to continue to keep that below the 20. And our 4 through 6 ratio was 20.72 to 1, which also is an excellent number when the state's number is, is 25. So we're very proud to be able to keep it at that number as well. Our attendance ratio is 96 percent for the month, which again is very high. Uh, we're very proud of that as well. Special ed over the year has grown in, in the pre-K about 10 students from the beginning, and we always watch that number because that's obviously an indicator for what we're going to have when they move up into our uh, K through 6 configuration, but it's grown 10, so um, we feel pretty good about that. It's actually 10 less than last year. Last year we had 75 by the end, so we're, we're feeling okay there. Our average district-wide PTR is at 19.58. So district-wide, we're still under the 20 to 1 benchmark that we had tried to shoot for. So does anyone have any questions on our attendance report for the month? Mrs. Smith? It actually has something to do with attendance, but how do, how do we uh, read on sixth grade for next year? Uh, we're getting those reports. The schools are getting them now. It looks like we may have one or two schools that may actually grow a sixth grade. 
and we're waiting to see what their final numbers. A lot of times the intent to return is one thing. The actual, when they show up, is another. So we try not to overreact. Our past history has been that the number for sixth grade is always less than what they say their intent is. So we are watching it. But it looks, two schools look like they may actually grow in the, in the sixth grade class. It's Philip? Um, it, mine was a different topic, but I was just going to say, um, many times when a new school opens, there's that a, a initial a flight to the new uh, school, the a middle school, but then after that, things seem to settle back down and our sixth grade stable up. So I just want to throw that in. But um, mine was a financial question. I remember at our study session, we asked Dr. Gilbert, after the budget was presented, and we know it's just recently been presented, uh, if you could give us some sort of plan for um, funding the technology we are so desperately going to need in the upcoming 2013. And I can talk to you a little bit about that, just without a formal plan, but I can, I can talk to you a little bit about that. I think there are a couple things. One is that, that um, we don't have textbooks to buy again, which will be a great blessing because we spent three quarters of a million last year on textbooks. So the reading that would be coming up next year will not, we will not have to purchase that. We already have purchased that. Um, I think that we're also looking at the possibility of, I, I don't want to go to the council for operation budget, but they were very, appreciative of the fact that we have not been to them for several years. So I think if push comes to shove, we can do that. I think probably we'll, we will grow several students. Um, I think there's an indication that we may even in a couple of years not need the number of interventionists that we have. So I think there's several things that will help that. I think that um, we just recently, we are going to be more actively seeking grants. And what we will do with that is, for example, the grant that we got from the Jennings or Rebecca Jones Foundation, we will look at what we can replace, if any Anything in the general purpose budget for staff development. Uh, we're, not in, we're not seeing a decrease in the title funds, which has been pretty surprising, and, and we really thought that we would, so we'll have to watch that. But I think that one of the things we were concerned about is whether we would have to replace some of the title funding with GP. We, we don't think we're going to have to do that next year. So I think really it's going to be a case of looking at where can we get money um, from the savings that we would have in textbooks, from the savings we would have in professional development, and seeing where we go from there. I'm sure you're keeping Mr. Lyons in the loop, yes. and so if they see this money set aside, yes. that they understand that it's it's earmarked right. for state law technology. Right. Okay. We we had a good conversation with with him, and and they are understanding that we are looking at uh, purchasing technology as soon as we hear whatever it is we will hear from the state as far as what we can use for the the park test, mm -hmm. and so I think that they will be looking at us for expenditures and that in that line. If we can do that on our own, then certainly we will do that. Um, I appreciate very much the comment that I heard from at least one council member that said we we know when you come to us and you're asking for money that you really need it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's true. They're aware that we have taken a lot of the capital improvements on our own shoulders and I think they have been very gracious and I haven't heard a single complaint or concern about their understanding that we do need a new school and we do need the, the Bradley elevator. So I'm very appreciative to Council of their relationship with us and their knowing that when we come to them, we really do do need to come to them for the money. The Council's been very gracious to us and we have a great representative <laughs> liaison. So. Mr. Campbell. You mentioned the elevator at Bradley. Is that not a go? Yes. Right now? Yes. It it's in the okay. it's in the capital. It okay. it should be in their capital improvement plan. Okay. That along with the Hobgood addition and the new school. Okay. Yes, we've heard nothing to indicate otherwise. As I said, they they were um, very gracious to us when we did our presentation and and I shared our appreciation to them for for the relationship we have. I think uh, the relationship that we have with our governmental partners, the Parks and Rec, uh, Housing Authority, Police, I think is probably as good as I've ever seen it. And I'm, I know that when uh, when I call them, they're there. And I really appreciate that very much. 
transparent. I just want to compliment Linda and Gary for representing us at the budget meeting very, you know, really well. You know, sitting through that, it was a, it was a process. But thank you for being there and representing us. Well, I appreciate the board support very much. Are there any other questions for Mr. Anderson or Dr. Gilbert? Well, other business. Uh, Ms. Wade, I do have a couple of things. Sure. Um, I was asked to, to discuss the, the whole process of the state law changing, which has to do with TCAP third through eighth grade achievement, uh, the TCAP testing being included in the final grade. So I'm going to try to explain that, which should be quite a feat. Um, but, but the state law did change, and it does read that both TCAP 3 through 8 achievement and TCAP in of course assessment scores will be factored into students' second semester final grade. So that becomes important. For achievement, the score will account from 15 to 25 percent of the grade as determined by the local board of education. I'm very grateful to our board for including 15 percent. So what that will look like, we recently got quick scores that are still embargo, so we really can't talk about that. But it does provide our schools with the ability to share those scores with parents and of their individual children and for us to go ahead and factor those grades in. So what that will look like is this. When you think about science, social studies, math, and reading, those are the four content areas. And we in our school district are divided up by nine weeks. So the final grade in reading then, we will have 25% will come from that first nine weeks. 25% will come from the second nine weeks. And then remember that the law says that the TCAP impacts the second semester. So for the third nine weeks then, the, the grade that the child will get from the teacher for that nine weeks will count for 17.5%. For the fourth nine weeks, it will count for 17.5%, and that will allow, allow the rest of that 100% to come from the 15% TCAP. The way that will work is Mickey and Trent, it, it, it works, I know, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is, there's logic to this. Um, and, and thankfully, the good part is that, that Mickey and Trent, who are our technology folks, have figured out a template, and so what our teachers and principals will be doing is plugging in um, that quick score, and that will automatically generate what that final grade will, will do. So that, that is a real blessing. But I feel comfortable with what the board decided as far as the 15%. Um, frankly, I would have liked no percent, but that's not my call. That's the state's call. And so I, I feel comfortable that we are ready and that we are moving forward in every school and we are abiding by the law and the students will receive their grades. I, the second thing I would like to say, and then if you have questions that I may or may not be able to answer about that, um, but the second thing I would like to say is we had a principal who is retiring, and um, we just recently celebrated that retirement, and that's Ms. Barbara Sales. And I want to thank her for her years of service for Hobgood. I realize that we recognized her the other day. But also I'd like to thank Michelle McVicker. She will be taking a principalship in Nashville, and she has quite a challenge on her hands because it, it is a turnaround school school that she will be um, uh, working with there. And I want to congratulate um, Dr. Tammy Grizzard, who will be the new principal at Hobgood. She has a background at Hobgood and today received a standing ovation from the faculty when we announced that she would be the, the principal. So I'm very confident in, in the future of Hobgood with, with Dr. Grizzard at the helm. Thank you. There were some questions. Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Phillips. I can't see her, but I think Dr. Grizzard is here, so I, I know you're going to do it. Is she here? I see the top of the head. I, I can only see the tops of heads. So sorry. <laughs> I, that was, I'm very excited. She'll do a beautiful job with Hobgood, and um, she, she will just do a great job. I'm really excited about that. Um, my question was back to the quick score. Sure. So when the parents get the children, receive the children's grades, it will be just like reading 90%. It will not be broken down into the different parts. Is that right? You will have, and, I, and I'll share this with you, but what you will have is there will be a sticker that's going to go on each report card, and it will have reading, math, social studies, and science, and then it will have first, second, third, fourth, then it will have TCAP, and then it will have final that will be after that. So they will see what the TCAP um, score will be as far as 
um, there is a numeric grade, but then that has been translated by the state into whether that is below basic, basic, proficient, or advanced. And the numeric grade is what will be used to figure in with, with the other grades to get that final grade. Thank you. My question was how it was going to look because these children have already received their third um, nine weeks grades and how are these quick scores coming in going to impact that? Are we, we're not going to be changing their grade on, from that they saw originally, but the, the quick scores are going to impact that. Grade. Right. There will, it will have to do with the percent, the weight of the weight of each of those. Okay. Okay. Ms. Kemp. We've, we've talked about these, um, what percentage we're going to count as grades, and, and I, I will say this again, I think one of the biggest fallacies in that process is for the young student who is in the sixth grade but is in resource and working on a third grade level, and when that child goes to take those TCAP tests, they're taking them on the sixth grade level. And I think that's really unfair, but that's, we don't have any control over that, but it is a it's a major concern, particularly to those parents who have children in those situations. And that's not only in Murfreesboro City Schools, but I think that's everywhere as well. Are there any more comments or any other business? Mrs. Ridley, if you would get some dates together for the board uh, concerning the retreat. It did come up during the meeting that we wanted to work on our vision for the board and we'll see when everybody is available uh, for the retreat coming up in the fall. Yes, ma'am. Fall of the year. And by that time, uh, maybe all of us will have in mind what we'd like to see as part of the new vision. If there is nothing else, certainly we uh, extend congratulations both to Mrs. Sales for the wonderful job she has done at Hopgood and the wonderful staff that I know hated to see her go. And the retirement uh, festivities were beautiful, tearful, but beautiful. And certainly Dr. Grizzard will be a wonderful addition to Hopgood. She's familiar with them and uh, I think she'll work well. If nothing else, we will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs>